Welcome to the Reviews Without Remorse podcast with Joe and Dan. Be warned, the discussions in this podcast may contain detailed spoilers. For spoiler-free reviews of newly released films, be sure to check out our show on our YouTube channel. Enter at your own risk and enjoy the show. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Message, Alex Kurtzman. Beam aboard with myself, who is David, and my Captain Joe. This is Reviews Without Remorse. And this is episode 174, and in this show we will discuss Superman and Lois in a brand new CW TV series. It got a trailer, so Joe and I may point and laugh now. Speaking of point and laugh, I'm very curious to hear Joe's take on the first trailer for Godzilla vs. Kong. And then, Star Trek films change forever, as Joe and I review the ever-classic Star Trek the Wrath of Khan. What's up, my man? Uh, not much, not much, my friend. Exhausted, as uh, as, as I'm sure you already know. Uh, the, the big move is uh, this. The, the the move is never ending, uh, but it's it's winding down. Uh, so yeah, boy, am I just kind of tired. <laughs> the move goes ever on and on. <laughs> exactly, exactly. For, for the Lord of the Ring ner- nerds out there. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking forward to a nice break to talk about movies, so let's get to it. When we were dreaming about having a family, it didn't look like this, did it? Lost jobs, teens with severe anxiety, parents gone too soon. Why'd you move the family here? Still looking for the simple life? Because those days are gone, Clark. Long gone. You got the weight of the world on your shoulders. Really wish I could get drunk sometimes. So you have uh, the George Reeves Superman TV series, which is a classic all on its own. Uh, You know, a little dated, you know, maybe not quite modern sensibilities or whatever you want to call it. I don't care. It was what it was for its time. And George Reeves was outstanding in the part. Uh, you had a Superboy show. I don't know if you remember this. There was actually a, a, a Superboy show in like the 70s. But probably uh, the, the, the best known modern day superhero Superman show would be Lois and Clark with, uh, with Dean Cain and Terry Hatcher. You remember that show, right? <laughs> Sure do. All right. All right. Well, welcome to Superman and Lois. This is um, this is a CW show, which means it's going to be filled with a lot of relationship drama. Isn't that lovely? Hmm? <laughs> mm. uh, I got I, I got to tell you, when I first saw the trailer for this, I remember kind of sending it your way saying, hey, what is this? Because I. I I'm kind of um, I'm a little behind. I I I, I feel I, I think I have been watching it. I have not been watching it, but I know there is a Supergirl show in mm-hmm. existence. I believe in that show they got around to Superman, which I kind yes. of felt like, wow, that was sort of under the radar. I, I got a full blown Superman on TV and I'm not watching it. Uh, and then all of a sudden I saw this trailer. So I assume that it's a spinoff from Supergirl, which kind of sounds a little backwards, but hey, that's the world we live in. It is. It's, it actually is. It's played by the same actor, Tyler Hawkland, Hock- I believe that's how his name is uh, pronounced. Lois is played by Elizabeth Tulloop. Uh And honestly, I, I watched the CW series for a while there until they just got way out there. They just got ridiculous. Not even funny. I don't even want to get into it. But my, my, my point is, is that I've seen him and he, you know, I thought he did a great Clark and I thought he was a great Superman. I, I don't think he's a terrible, you know, choice. I just I'm kind of done with, the, you know, the CW's idea of what a superhero show is where it's like, you know, well, well, we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about politics and we're going to talk about, you know, mirroring this and it's about it's just I don't really have a lot of hope for it. I mean, granted. For a TV show, the special effects looked okay. I was kind of hoping for better, maybe. So, eh. 
Yeah. yeah. I, I, I gotta tell you, I, ironically, I've, I feel like I've probably, I've, I've never gotten into any of the CW. I don't think I've ever gotten into a CW show period. Cause, cause I, I kind of feel like what started out as pretty fresh and new turned generic very quickly. Like they kind of redefined yes. generic. And so I sort of feel like all those shows are very similar. You know, if I, if I see one, I've seen every one of them. So, yeah, I, I but but again, this one, it caught my eye. But, yeah, you're you're, you're right in the comparison to Lois and Clark. I felt like just by the trailer, I was like, this is exactly what this feels like. Mm-hmm. I'm not expecting much. I'm going to turn in tune in out of curiosity just to see, you know, what it is they're trying to do. If they can remember to do these shows as superhero shows, you know, maybe. Maybe I'll enjoy it. I don't know. It, it's hard because, like, now it's even worse because, like, now I feel like uh, I've gotten the taste of what a real comic book TV show could be with, with mm. WandaVision. And, and, and of course, we've got Falcon and Winter Soldier coming shortly uh, after that's done. So I kind of feel like these guys, you know, huh. you know what else doesn't help? I've been doing a rewatch of Daredevil lately. And you want to talk yeah. about a superhero show? My God. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of, I, you know, I, 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 again, I haven't seen the CW shows, but I feel like just the comparison is kind of unfair because, I mean, the CW TV shows are just TV shows that they, they feel like just TV shows. I, again, kind of go harkening back to Lois and Clark style episodic TV shows uh, to compare it to to WandaVision or anything similar is probably really not fair, but hey. This is our only chance. We have to take it. We need Kong. The world needs him. To stop what's coming. And this child, she's the only one he'll communicate with. I knew that they had a bond. She had nowhere to go, so I made a promise to protect her. And I think that in some way, Kong did the same. To say that my son was squealing with the light is an understatement. <laughs> he savored and loved every second of this trailer of Godzilla vs. Kong. He was just big old smiles. And you know something, Joe? Regardless of what we are about to say, you have to admit that there are going to be movies that have just passed us by. That, you know, <laughs> it, it, they're just they're not for us. We have to accept mm. the fact that there are going to be movies out there that are not for us, okay? Uh, and this kind of feels like one of those movies. I love Godzilla, uh, and, I, and I've been kind of looking forward to the Godzilla vs. Kong trailer uh, since they announced the movie. But as I was watching it, all I could say to myself was, you're really missing out by not having a man in the suit. It, the CG is just so glaringly obvious. It's, it's I can't make that disconnect i can't yeah. uh suspend reality to to make it work in my head because i know it's all bits and bytes and stuff like that and i feel kind of bad about that i envy i envy my son's ability to let go and just enjoy the spectacle but i can't yeah. uh i think that uh, first of all they're totally hinting at mecha godzilla i don't know if you got that but they're totally hinting about mecha godzilla and that and that alone is keeping me interested in that because I want to see how they pull off Mecha Godzilla. But other than that, I feel like it's going to be like, um, like, like King, uh, the King of the Monsters, where you know, yeah. okay, humans, that's that's nice, you know, that's great that you're trying to save on the CGI budget. Can we get back to the big monsters beating each other up, please? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I think you hit it on the head. I, I think this is uh, King Kong and Godzilla for the Fast and the Furious generation. I, I, it's it's not for us. Um, and, and, and there's it, nothing and wrong it, with that. There's nothing wrong with that. I want to put that out there. Well, I, I, <laughs> oh, I love it. Go, 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 go. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I personally sort of, I mean, put it this way. 
let me uh what's the word i'm looking for let me be realistic in in my uh when we were young we watched a grown man in in a suit stomp on on cardboard boxes uh, looked looking like buildings and we were fine with that uh so i i'm not exactly getting on my high horse and saying you know that that the new one has to be high art uh, et cetera. I, I'm certainly not criticizing like, you know, the, the current generation who sees this and, and, and will enjoy it. Um, but, but I still sort of I, I watched the trailer and I said to myself, boy, how how is it that, the, that that I'm not getting excited about this? How is it that something on this scale uh, isn't even remotely interesting? It, it's and I, and I I and I hate to sound like a broken record because I know I've I've kind of gone back gone here before, but I keep going back to Shin Godzilla, no. and I and I keep saying to myself now now why did they get it so right? And honestly, it, it really just has to do with the idea that they understand uh, scale. They they understand how to make it look like. This thing is happening in a more realistic world so I can marvel at the size and scale and scope of what's happening as opposed to watching the CGI battle of of of, of King Kong and Godzilla where the, the camera is always at eye level. And I'm saying to myself, these guys could be six feet tall. It doesn't matter because, again, the the, the because they're doing it all in CG, they have they, they can put the camera anywhere they please. They can just and, and it just sort of makes the whole thing level out. So there is no sense of scale. There is no sense of epic proportions. Uh, I mean, frankly, I wouldn't mind it if they kind of made it look like a lot of this was happening in a, in a sort of a fisheye lens to give me a sense of just just how big this is. I wouldn't mind it if they purposely made some of it hard to see, because if I were watching this from the ground level, it, a lot of it would be hard to see. But no, I'm getting it, it's kind of like it's not too dissimilar from the discussion we had not that long ago about why does Luke Skywalker look not quite right in the the conclusion of Mandalorian and I said I, I one of the things I said is because they make him look too perfect the, you, you have the luxury to to get it exactly right so when he's standing there looking like his his school picture you know, like with the perfect lighting, the perfect soft lighting, while, ever, while everyone else is sort of in, in more harsher lighting, et cetera, that's why, it, that's why the disconnect. And I'm saying the same thing here. Again, you, you, they have the luxury to, to do anything they please. They haven't learned to try to give themselves limitations, even implied limitations. And I, I kind of feel like that's when you'll start to see the CGI done right, when they, when, when they really do – kind of take it to the next level okay we we've we've gotten to where we can do anything let's pretend we can't you know let's pretend we can't do anything what would we do uh and i kind of feel like that's when it'll kind of get even better but yeah i i like i said i don't blame the current generation i'm happy that the current generation can watch this trailer and get excited for me not so much showing my age but hey <laughs> it is what it is beyond the darkness Beyond the human evolution is Khan, a genetically superior tyrant, exiled to a barren planet, banished by a starship commander he is destined to destroy. Left for dead, he has survived. I'll chase him round the moons of Nibia and round the under. Taris, Maelstrom, and round Perdition's flames before I give him up. With the assistance of the Enterprise crew, Admiral Kirk must stop an old nemesis, Khan Nunyan Sion, from using the life-generating Genesis device as the ultimate weapon. Written by Jack B. Sewards, based on a story by Harve Bennett and Jack B. Sewards, based on the television series Star Trek, created by Gene Roddenberry, directed by Nicholas Meyer, Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan. You nerds have no idea how getting information about new movies was back in the 80s. No <laughs> idea. Nowadays, Kevin Feige farts and 80 videos go up on YouTube. 
<laughs> but back then, back then, there was almost nothing. You heard they may be doing Star Trek. You heard they may be bringing back Khan from the season one episode, Space Seed. Okay, that, that was really all you heard. And then, spoiler alert, for a 30-year-old movie, you heard the first grumblings that Spock was going to die. No, no follow-up articles, no 10-minute uh, YouTube video, you know, asking you to smash that like button, et cetera, so on and so forth. Just, you know, you just you heard it through like third parties, you know, whispers amongst your friends. You nerds today have no idea how good you have it. <laughs> nor do we as star trek fans realize just how good we have it to me star trek 2 the wrath of khan is the last true star trek movie in the respect that it remembered that it, it had that bit of swashbuckle but it also remembered to have the human element the very thing that most that even the new shows seem to forget you know the the the, the just there i don't believe and there have still been good star trek movies don't 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 get me wrong but this one to me is the high watermark of the series like this and and, and it's it's that's both a good thing and a bad thing which we're going to hopefully uh delve into we've got a lot of time so i'm sure we'll, we'll be able to get to most of it but mm. this is the best of the star treks I challenge anybody to tell me there's a better one, even from the Kelvin timeline or whatever you want to call it. This is it. This is the high water mark. This is the one you show off to people. Uh, yes, I cannot argue with that uh, at all. I, I, I completely agree with you. And it's funny, we, we raved last week, you know, about um, I, maybe rave is a strong word, but we, 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 we both surprised ourselves by how strongly we felt um, about Star Trek, the motion picture after it after it being maligned uh, for, for decades. Uh, so I was sort of curious, are we, are we going to come in here and now suddenly temper our excitement for this film? Probably not. Uh, I, I think. Yeah, I think we still agree that this is uh, like you said, this is the watermark. This is easily the best star trek film uh it, it was so good that honestly it, it's one of those movies that that it is almost too good for its own good um if that makes any sense whatsoever because suddenly now the whole series now has something it has to uh, hold itself up against and as opposed to creating new exciting adventures every time we spent a lot of episodes after this kind of paying homage to this one. And it's, you know, uh, not without good reason, but, but again, it is what it is, but you're absolutely right. And we, and we did say that the last one felt like a long episode of star Trek. This one feels like a movie. It, it, it really does feel like it's a, it's a perfectly paced film uh, I, I, I love the, uh, you know, the stakes are high in this and, and not high, you know, the end of the world high, but just it, it's one of those where the personal tension is amped up. You know, I mean, seriously, we have a film, the first one, the whole world could could disintegrate at any minute. No one's getting their hair messed up. You know, here is quite the opposite. This is a very personal one on one struggle. And you feel the um, the, the sacrifice. You, you feel the the uh, the losses throughout this battle. I mean, it, it, it really is just spectacular. Uh, and, and again, it, it kind of does hit on every level. I mean, again, you have an epic space battle, but you also have very personal uh trials and tribulations uh so it, it really is just a home run and and again i i kind of feel like maybe even a little too good because the the subsequent films always struggled to keep up and you could feel you could feel that kind of battle and it, and it uh, never quite hits the same uh earmark 
I agree on that one, man. Well put, by the way. A a a excellent. And yes, you're right. It is it, it, this. It, the the sad thing is, is that we're reviewing it now, and we're reviewing it in retrospect of all that has come since, and we're recognizing that you know, great as this movie is, it also put a mindset in creators to follow, uh, who creators who have followed from this movie, mm. put them in a mindset of what a Star Trek movie uh, needs to be. Okay. The fact that the, the fact that they suddenly decided that each Star Trek needs, you know, for lack of a better term, a Bond villain. That's yeah. let's let's face it. Khan is a Bond villain. Not you know, not in the traditional sense, but it, he is Kirk's Bond villain, and I, and completely understandable reason why they would do that. Uh, hum, humanizing the character, humanizing Kirk. Uh, you know, Kirk, you know, finding out about his son, you know, feeling like getting he's, he's getting old and stuff like that. The fact that I'm watching a movie where it's the first time Captain Kirk needs reading glasses as I'm wearing my <laughs> reading glasses, uh, you know, while we're talking about this, you know, yeah. it, it, it's it's it, it even hit a little bit uh, harder now as, as an older man. Mm. But, but, but when it first came out, I mean, you know, and by the way, you, you got to love. Uh, Nicholas Meyer, who like basically said in interviews that that whole Kobayashi Maru thing at the beginning of the movie that was added, and and that's become a, a an iconic thing. They added that whole sequence. They were just gonna have like you know a training a training exercise going wrong, but they had it that like all the characters died at, at the beginning of it to to throw people off from the rumors of. Spock dying, making people think, "Oh, okay, yeah, yeah." You know, that's what that that's that's what they meant by by, by Spock was going to die. That, that whole scene and and that whole Kobayashi Maru thing is now like a huge freaking thing in the Star Trek universe. Thanks, Nicholas Meyer. Really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, uh, but 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 all kidding aside, it is a great way to to start things off. Okay, it really does set the tone that you know it n that nothing is as it seems, and yet there is still that great familiarity with all the characters you know kirk and, and and mccoy have their great little thing spock is you know he's he's now captain of the enterprise and he's you know it's now a training vessel and a part of me feels like yeah you know what that kind of makes sense it is an older ship i'm sure there are newer ships and eventually they introduce like the excelsior and stuff like that but again that's the next movie we'll get to that later mm. the 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 idea of studying you know Horatio Hornblower, which is how Kirk was always described, it, it, growing old, I, it, it's a great topic to discuss. And, you know, yeah, of course, Kirk's been around the galaxy once or twice. Him knocking up a doctor, that that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> I, I don't know what space condoms are like, but one gets the feeling like, oh, no, I've got Andorian herpes. <laughs> the you fact know, that his kid wasn't half green was was a blessing. Yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take a quick moment and talk about uh, the director of the movie, Nicholas Mayer. Mm. Uh, he got this part for, uh, like, and this is a guilty pleasure favorite movie of mine. It was an HBO movie. Do you remember the movie Time After Time? Um, if it's the one I'm thinking of, yes. In fact, I was just thinking about that movie today, actually. Mm. H.G. Wells. Uh, yeah, Rodney McDowell. Yep, Roddy McDowell has to go to the future to stop Jack the Ripper. Yeah, yeah. I, I was my mother in law was watching the original Time Machine, and I had I literally just asked her today. I'm like, you ever see this uh, time after time? Because I they said she'd probably like it. That's yeah, a very. That's a great underrated film. I I agree, and a lot of the the a lot of that humanism and interaction and yet still action pieces are very evident it's why nicholas meyer was uh was probably called in for this he wrote and directed time after time and here he is well he gets he didn't get credited but from what i understand myers did a lot of onset rewrites of things to to, to get i mean there, there's mm. there's things that was not in the script like the whole the whole moment with like kirk i'm mean, excuse me with spock and mccoy where he touches his face and says remember that right. wasn't in the script. That wasn't supposed to happen. He was just supposed to go inside the damn thing. Mm. So there, there, there's the, the, the okay. Uh, now that we've gotten past the behind the scenes uh, uh, 
uh, click clap. Let's talk <laughs> about the movie itself. We are introduced, reintroduced to Khan, uh, you know, Ricardo Montalban in his late 50s with pecs I wish I had. And yes, those were his pecs. That wasn't <laughs> special effects. Yeah. <laughs> Holy smokes, that man. Um, we introduced him, introduced him to his family. Uh, a little continuity error, you know, with having uh, Chekhov being the one to discover him. Chekhov wasn't even on the ship at that point. Right, right. Yep. But, Very um, true. Hmm. But still, I, 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 I felt like it was a very nice reintroduction to the character. Even for people like like you could show this movie to people who hadn't seen Space Seed, and even if you hadn't seen it, you get the gist of what everything was, and you, you got you got to really really admire that. You know, it's like okay, mm. people know Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. You know, let's start working on other things. So they tried to flesh out all the different characters. They gave, you know, Chekhov a time to shine. They gave Sulu a time to shine. Uhura. Scotty. Scotty, I feel bad about. And that's something we'll talk about as we as, as we get into it. Because he had this whole other subplot that got cut from the movie that was just, ugh. I hate mm. that they cut that out. But again, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, You've got outstanding special effects. You've got an outstanding score from, and this was like his first movie, James Horner. I, I, I have nothing to complain about this movie. This is going to be a gush fest podcast, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm <laughs> apologizing about it. Yeah. Uh, yes, all of the above. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's funny. One of the things I've, I, I, again, they hit the mark so well, I think it intimidated them going forward. One of the things I could never understand is why they didn't, do the same thing with future films. And what I mean is when they, they basically were mining the old episodes for, uh, from what I hear, they were looking primarily for a good villain. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Ricardo Montalban as Khan is spectacular. Uh, and from there, the story grows I never understood why they didn't do that in the future. It was like they did it once. And they, and like I said earlier, all of the other subsequent films are kind of these these nods to this film. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you would you would have thought and don't even get me started on the uh, on the Calvin re 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 revisiting of Khan. Uh just I'll just say hot garbage. Uh, <laughs> why? Why? When you had this, this multiple seasons of multiple stories, why not more often go back and say, OK, well, Khan was great. We did that. Let's go back and find another one. Let's go back and and, and tap into another story or just kind of go in to, to say, oh, like they visited this planet and this happened. Why don't we do something here? I mean. Again, you, you had a plethora of material to mine. So, again, they, they were smart enough to do it with this one, but never smart enough to do it since. And I, I don't understand why. Uh, anyway, with that said, yeah, I I, I mean, the, the, this one, it was so smart how they did this. I, I th this um, and it does give you a feeling of the the intensity is there because, again, this is kirk's fight this is kirk's battle not that he chose it necessarily but something from his past so he's got the weight on his shoulders the idea that he's got all these trainees up there who are getting killed because of this guy khan who's there for kirk you know so i mean it i again the the drama the tension it it it, it works so well with that so yeah i mean it's just it just you, you can't beat this and honestly i i love the whole i mean the, the whole moby dick aspect which they sort of touch on you know in the story like there's certainly elements that they they it's not subtle no uh, in, in some of the, in the in the references but it works here so well it, it worked i mean they they did such a great job of again this kind of you know I, I remember kind of criticizing the um, Star Trek Into Darkness by saying it, it feels like a, it could easily just be a military movie. Mm -hmm. Like Star Trek Into Darkness feels like a movie that could have been about battleships or submarines and and really has nothing to do with Star Trek. Um, it's a full blown just military movie, uh, military story. This one hints at it, 
touches it, where where it does that battle of the two ships, uh, especially when you kind of get into the nebula where they're they're more or less doing this blind and stuff. I mean, it's just such a great um I mean, just such a great epic scene, you know, it, it has. And, and of course, when the when the ships blow up because the Genesis blows up, et cetera. I mean, that really does have just the perfect epic finale. You know, I mean, so the, the whole thing, I mean, all the pacing, the, the scale of the film just works so great. There she is. This is an extremely tautly, wonderfully edited movie. Each piece, each beat in this movie has purpose. Uh, what, what is your favorite thing you like to say? There is not a single shred of waste in any of the dialogue. Yeah. Yep. Uh, up save for one, which I'm going to get to. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it is my who asked you. So uh, I'm just hmm. going to save that for, for later. So I'm there, curious. There, there really isn't. Uh, uh, any waste in this movie at all uh every single piece me moving up to the next piece makes logical sense none of the characters do anything outside of the ordinary that made me feel like oh they're just artificially you know extending this like here's a lesser movie would have done everything in their power to try to make sure there was a scene between khan and kirk this movie yeah. was smart enough to say no, he's too strong. It, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one fight, Kirk will not survive. It mm. needs to be on a starship level. That's where Kirk Kirk would be the first to admit he got lucky against Khan the first time. Mm. Uh, if it hadn't been for if it hadn't been for the girl turning on on Khan. It, there's every possibility Khan would have won. No, Starship versus Starship. That's where Kirk shines. That's where he needs to be. Yeah. And I good. I I believe that they did at some point, and maybe one of the one of the drafts they did try to work that in, where there there was some sort of a face to face confrontation. But I I, I totally agree with you. It works much better without it. it. It just feels so much more realistic. And and, and had they done it, it would have felt ham fisted. Agreed. A absolutely, and that's evident in in Star Trek Three, which we'll get to. Um, huh, Reverend Jim, yeah, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. He he was Reverend Jim before he was Doc Brown. We'll talk about that in the next episode, everybody. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I actually had heard that as well, but I'm I'm glad that that never happened. I feel like, especially since both are so much older now in. But but Khan still, of course, is the superhuman. So in a, in a yeah. fair fist fight, there's there's not a chance. So and it, so, what would it have been? It, it would have been like well, Kirk would have had to phaser him, and then you know, well, there's an anticlimactic moment. No, it was good because by p keeping them in starships, it became an actual uh, battle of wits, and you know who had the most experience and who was the yeah. smarter who was the smarter captain. Uh, and in keeping with Khan's character, he's much more aggressive, and that was yes. exactly what he needed to be. And Kirk, yeah. being the um, outstanding captain that he is, was smart enough to exploit that to use it against him. And that right, and 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 you also you're hitting it on the head. Uh, there, because they right by doing this in the ships, you, you're all Khan is all of it also his own worst enemy in 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 the idea that he is self destructive, meaning he's he's going to take this battle to the nth degree, never relent, and and he he is the the master of his own undoing. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's the big part of it as well. And I do. I, I only sort of agree with you about your thought of they should have mined more from the original series. I kind of agree with you on that, but 
not completely. I kind of feel like that might have gotten them into a whole other bad pattern where, you know, and and the, to to give these guys their credit, they probably thought that they, you know, got lucky because there wasn't the availability of Star Trek back then as as there is today. You know, mm-hmm. you could you you know, nowadays you could say, "Oh, well, this this is based on such and such episode, you know, so people, okay, you know, get fire up the Netflix. Let's see this episode. And you can get all the preparation you need for that. And I kind of feel like you, you start getting into obscurity. It's like, what were they going to do? Bring back uh, the guardian of forever. Like discovery just tried doing that. And God, did that suck so much. <laughs> but that of course is an Alex Kurtzman, Kurtzman project, you know, which is yeah. why I brought his name up at the beginning of the show, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Well, and and you know what? You're 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 making a great point and I I probably should clarify uh put it this way, there's there's a lot of wrong ways they could have gone too. Uh right, had they just done movies that were sort of answers to episodes. Uh yeah, there's a lot of wrong things they could have done as well. I mean, I I don't want to see a whole episode about a, you know, a big green hand holding the ship. Um uh, you know, I, I, but I, I think that the observation still stands, though. I think that there was plenty in the series that they could have used as springboards, but, but, it, but yes, it could have easily gone the wrong way. Um, and, and plus, this film, again, you, you're also, I mean, not only do you have the space seed character, which is the springboard for the story. You also have so many other elements. You have again. You have the the uh, the, the trainees, the new ship, uh, Spock's new role in that. By the way, uh, you have Kirk's son. You have an old relationship. Uh, so right, the, the, I kind of feel like you could like if if they just said, okay, so Star Trek three, what do we do? Oh, let's go down to this episode and do that how do you how do you sort of match that that scope and scale with all the other things that are happening so yes that's that's certainly not a not a prescription for for a hit each time but again i still i still sort of say there was a lot there to sort of play with i mean put it this way this is a this, this is a film series that could have had fan service up the wazoo and i kind of feel like ironically as little fan service as there is even the newer kelvin movies do that like when in Star Trek Beyond, there's a couple of references to some things that happened in the original series that you blink and you miss it, but they're there. And and I kind of felt like the the original series films that we're talking about oddly didn't do much of that. You know, like like a lot, like it, they would walk into a place and there's like a whole lot of aliens, but not a lot of familiar aliens. Like they, they're certainly not doing it the way the Mandalorian is currently doing it uh, like the Mandalorian one of the things you love is that every place he goes all of those species of 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 aliens in the background most of the time you can pick them out and say oh that's that's this and that's that um the star treks don't do that a lot um uh, at least not again at least not in this iteration in fact and frankly i i, I don't think any iteration really uh, so and i kind of just sort of feel like that was always sort of a missed opportunity i man i'm Wow. <laughs> I know, Joe, take a breath once in a while so Dave can kind of chime in and <laughs> No, 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 it, it's it dude, it is okay. It is okay. You 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 said it like really really well. I I I'm not complaining at all. I'm just kind of feeling like, you know, this is why I do this show. You know, not only cuz I love you as a brother and everything like that, <laughs> but because just, you know, when we get into a topic where you've got that level of passion, and you let that out, it's like I'm in mm. awe of every word that comes out of your <laughs> mouth. Okay, now I'm oh, reviewing you. <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't be reviewing you on this one. Yeah. And it's interesting, too. I kind of feel like now with The Mandalorian, we we sort of have something to reference. You know, we, we sort of yeah. have a good reference uh, when it comes to, like, fan service done right. Mm. Um, so, but, but, but honestly, probably before The Mandalorian, we might not have had such, a, such an easy um, point of reference. You know, like, a lot of you know, I I, th- I think a lot of series have have been very shy about fan service, but suddenly now we have this great example of where they're doing it right. So it's it's very easy now to point the finger and say, oh, Star Trek, you should have done more of that. 
<laughs> but again, it was a different time. Captain, I'm getting something on the distress channel. On speakers. This is the Kobayashi Maru. 19 periods out of Altair 6. We have struck a brevitic mine and have lost all power. Our hull is penetrated and we have sustained many casualties. This is the Starship Enterprise. Your message is breaking up. Can you give us your coordinates? Repeat, this is the Starship. Enterprise, our position is Gamma Hydra, Section 10. In the neutral zone. Data on Kobayashi Maru. Subject vessel is third class Teutonic fuel carrier, crew of 81, 300 passengers. Damn. Mr. Sulu, plot an intercept course. May I remind the captain that if a starship enters the zone... I'm aware of my responsibilities, mister. We should talk about the introduction of Kirstie Alley. This was her first movie yeah. uh, as, 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 as Lieutenant Savick. Uh, the, a part that would eventually go to a different actress and then be completely rewritten for the sixth movie because she, I, I don't get it. Oh uh, yeah. I forgot about that. That's right. Yep. Good point. You know, she, she comes back for part three and part four, but not her, the character, different actress plays her. And then for Star Trek six, you know, they wanted to bring her back again, which honestly I w- would have worked better in Star Trek six. And we'll talk more about that when we get there, if it had been uh Savick, mm. but instead there's like, you know, no, they don't, we don't want a third actress to be playing this part. So let's just give it a whole other name. It's like, you've just completely lost an emotional connection, but whatever. Um, this was a great introduction. I mean, her character was originally supposed to be, it was supposed to be much more obvious that she was supposed to be quote unquote, part Romulan, part um uh vulcan which i'm not sure how that works since they're basically the same species just separated like you know it's like saying it's like saying that you know she's part english part american it's like that that's really the only difference (laughs) you're the same damn species for god's sake. right they're they're separated more by philosophy than anything else if i remember right exactly so i'm not 100 percent sure where they were trying to go with that but whatever um, I thought it was a fine, you know, a first showing uh, for Kirstie Alley. You know, it's a shame she went batshit crazy, but that's not a subject we need to talk about during this show. <laughs> um, but yes, you know, it was, it, and and it's what's really a shame is there's like there was this great potential in this character that I don't think that they utilized very well for the rest of the series. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would have to agree with that. I, I kind of, um, yeah, it, it felt like she was perfect in here. And then suddenly now they, they had this extra character. They didn't know quite what to do with. It's interesting too, because I've been watching a lot of the, um, the making of behind the scenes and, and I hear different versions of things. So it's hard to know, um, definitively how or why, one of the things I heard is that the whole reason the Savic character is there is because they they were going to write off Spock pretty early on in the story. Um, the the thinking was that Leonard Nimoy was really tired of playing Spock. Uh, I mean, he wrote a whole book at one point. I am not Spock. I mean, he was he was obviously struggling with with being typecast. So the thought. At one, I think early on in the drafts was that, okay, well, we're going to kill off Spock. So why don't we just have another Vulcan? But as, as things sort of, sort of evolved, Spock is there until the very end. So this, yeah, I think that the role of the Savic character was kind of always changing, but yeah, with that said, I think she's a great character in this film. Once they're done, they seem like they, they're, they're not positive what to do with her. Yeah, search for Spock. I mean, she she's she's a fine character, but yeah, the the change of actress really does stand out, and I I don't know why, I don't know the the real details of why they couldn't get Kirstie Alley back. And I agree with you. By six, it would have been pretty impressive, right? This would have been a character that you knew pretty well yeah. at that point, and then the the shock of her betrayal. Um, would have had some weight to it. So, um, yeah, but I think here she's really good. I think she's, she's a great character. Uh, I love how she's kind of the, um, like, like she, she, like the fact that she's badgering Kirk a little bit about the Kobayashi Maru thing. I think again, it's a great 
way to sort of bounce like you get to know her character and you're also getting to know his character by the by the way these two are sort of butting heads a little bit um by the way i think one of my favorite characters in this film for for weird reasons is spock i i think you're seeing uh, spock sort of hit that new level where he's kind of graduating into more of the yoda character where i i feel like that the 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 sort of die hard logical Spock starts to graduate a little bit more into oh, almost like where it's like where Doc Brown kind of kind of at some point goes well I figured what the hell I I sort of feel like Spock is doing this where he's he's sort of becoming his years are 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 bringing him a sense of maturity and and a and a sense of I don't want to say casualness. But th- but that not every single solitary thing has to be rigid and done by the book, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the great moment is where he asks Savick, "Have you ever piloted a, a starship out of space, Doc?" Lieutenant, have you ever piloted a starship out of space, Doc? Never, sir. Take her out, Mister Savick. Aye, sir. For everything, there is a first time, Lieutenant. Don't you agree, Admiral? Mm-hmm. Aft thrusters, Mr. Sulu. Aft thrusters. Would you like a tranquilizer? I had one quarter impulse power. And one quarter impulse power. And Kirk and Bones are kind of smirking. And Spock picks this up and he says, Take her out, Mr. Zavik. And he and I, I mean <laughs> that to me is priceless. That is a that is a priceless moment. And again, it really does sort of um, signify a change in Spock's character. Um, I mean, and and, and, I'll, and I'll I'll have to give the Kelvin the first Kelvin film credit because I I kind of felt that they did that very wisely in that film, where we're, we are kind of getting that older Spock, where again, not everything has to be crucial and critical. At one point, you see him give Scotty the uh, the the formulas for space beaming, whatever it is in motion, whatever they called it. Yeah. Beaming uh, from, you know, from one moving object into another moving object. Yeah. And I mean, and, and it's, and it was clever because again, I, 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 it was, it was like, you're, you're sort of getting a little bit of that. Like, like the, the voice of doc Brown. Oh, you shouldn't do this because you're messing with the whatever. And Spock is like, look, it, it, things happen. Life goes on like not not everything is crucial and critical not to z- disturb the, the, the tiniest little detail. Mm-hmm. Um, so, again, yeah, I, I, I love how they're playing. I love how they're doing Spock in this film. They, they really do. It, it's a big leap forward from the last one. Again, I, I kind of mentioned that they, they were kind of they were they were writing these characters in the motion picture like they were kind of almost caricature ish where it's like okay i spock's got to be this way and, and bones has got to be this way um this one now they're they're playing a little more they're playing jazz and it's it's working i think they're really working well i agree uh 100 on that i the thing that the modern movies n- are missing they don't understand what truly made this? They see whiz bang boom and so on and so forth. They don't see yeah. the the little Spock Yoda moments, which we never got. We got like a antagonistic Spock. We never really got a sage Spock in in the Kelvin timeline. Uh, Wait, which I and, and yeah, I'll give them a little little leeway there because I, I I remember feeling like I didn't even like the Spock in the first Kelvin very much, and possibly any of them, frankly. Um, but I, but I did sort of. I said to myself, "All right, but this is young, serious Spock, you know, almost to where the, the scene where they he meets his older self. I, I liked it, and I kind of felt like, and it was almost like older Spock is saying, just relax and smell the roses a little bit, you know what I mean? And I, so I, th- I thought it was okay, but but yes, you're you're correct in everything you just said. It's a, it's an excellent movie." It is well done, well acted across the board. It was nice to to give more human moments to both to all the characters. Like that, that famous scene you were just talking about when they were going out of space talk. You gotta love you, you gotta love McCoy with his. Do you want a sedative, Jim? 
and 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 his response and yeah. and and Shatner instead of hamming it up with a big you know no thank you or anything like that he just nervously shakes his head. What a great <laughs> response to that. Yeah, yeah. Shatner works uh, best when he's being subtle. I find like he the the little things he does like you know just that moment where he puts his glasses on when he's trying to get the 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 key code for uh for for, for the rely and everything like that i love yeah. that little moment that that little moment of self consciousness and just kind of like you know damn pushing through it everything like that love yeah. those little moments like that um the the characters surrounding it all have their little place the introduction of david and subsequent quick death of david in the next movie mm. which we will get to the introduction of carol marcus who from what i understand by the way it was supposed to be it was originally supposed to be uh, another character from the tv show and you see there, there's where you're talking about where for a while there they might have gone too far on the fan service uh if they had you know brought in not just back not brought back not just Khan, but also brought back some other actress from the original they were originally going to bring back um, the actress who played uh, MacGyver's, who was Khan's wife. But unfortunately, the actress uh, got multiple uh, multi multiple sclerosis and was confined to a wheelchair. So oh. sad mm. about that. But um, uh, OK, but to sum up, this is truly the best of Star Trek in film form, in television form. That's a whole other debate that we can have. But in film form. This is the high watermark, and to date, it hasn't come close. Scotty, I need warp speed in three minutes or we're all dead. I've done far worse than kill you. I've hurt you. And I wish to go on hurting you. I shall leave you as you left me. Marooned for all eternity. Buried alive. Buried alive. Sean! How close though, Joe? How close did they get? <laughs> uh yeah, boy, I you know, this is another one that's going to be tough to rank, but I think uh if I remember correctly, I think last week was an 8, so I think this is probably very easily a step up. So, uh I think a 9 is perfectly fair. Yeah, I I think I I I think this is a film that will most fans, I think, would agree. Most fans of just science fiction adventure films would say this is easy. This this film stacks up with Star Wars, um, Alien. I I, I kind of feel like this. Most people would agree that this this ranks up there with some of the greatest science fiction films ever. Uh, it's well done. Uh, we mentioned. I mentioned. I remember last week talking about world building and how they did a great job making it feel like you could step into this world. And I feel like this one is the same where again, everything is sort of believable to the point where you, you feel like you are very submerged in this world. Uh, I, I would even rank this up there with films that are probably m more immersive, like a, like a, like a Blade Runner alien aliens uh, films. This one, again, it, it's, it's, it's probably not, um, like again, th this sort of feels like the where I see the world sort of moving at that point in time. So it again, there's there is a just a it's a very logical feel. Uh, so yeah, I, again, I I think all the characters are great. The new characters, the classic characters, everyone is is uh, spectacular. It's a one of the most. It's a perfect story. I, I think the pacing is great. It, it, the conclusions are great. Uh, just well done all around. I, I, and, and honestly, the the emotional finale, um, I, I feel like, boy, <clears throat> is that earned? Is that ever earned? And I, and I, I feel like, uh, I mean, the death of Spock is, is not a cheap ploy uh, to kind of wrench the emotions a little before the ending. No, I mean, this... The way his character develops, even just in the course of this film, uh, the way you see him act uh, and his obvious, I mean, the the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the, the few. Uh, it, perfectly logical conclusion. I, I, I think this film is is spectacular. And I again, I, I think a nine is spot on. 
in some ways, I feel like that nine, which I agree with you, and in fact, I have given this movie also a nine, is not, it, it doesn't, it almost feels like it's not giving this movie enough credit for just how mm. changing it was. Okay, okay. Uh, this is Star Trek's, you know, Empire Strikes Back, so to speak. Uh, uh, yeah. Ironic, considering it came out a year after Empire Strikes Back. What you have here is everything firing perfectly. You're still keeping with the human adventure. The human adventure is just beginning, is how Star Trek The Motion Picture ended. And I feel like they kept that promise, because this was a very much human adventure, but with elements of madness in, in the form of Khan, uh, and Maybe we haven't said it enough, but God darn it. Did Maltoban just just like embody that role? Mm -hmm. Did it not seem like this guy was having the time of his life playing a villain? Just, you know, enjoying this every scene, every shout, every scream. His his rendition of from hell's heart, I stabbeth thee for hate's sake. I spit my last breath at thee. <laughs> Holy madre de Dios. Yeah. <clears throat> and you have no idea what it was like to be a 13-year-old kid in that movie theater crying your damn eyes out during Spock's death, okay? At the time, you know, you thought this was it. You, 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 you thought, you know, there, this, is, this is Star Trek. You don't come back from the dead in, in Star Trek. That's not how it works. You know, okay, you could do little tricks and stuff like that, but there was no obvious trick up to that point that could have possibly brought him back from the dead until you know genesis plant duh of course but you know that, that another story we'll get to that for the next movie mm. everybody is bringing their a game everybody gets their shining moments every element that they add to the story of kirk spock mccoy sulu uhura uh, check off all works beautifully the only person that i feel got short staffed uh short uh short uh sticked was scotty but we'll get to that in a minute uh excellent movie i love it i have seen it dozens of times it was it was like it was like a cold winter's night and my grandmother's stew that's what this watching this movie felt like when i when i did yeah. it again and you, you can't you can't top that yeah um with you there brother it, it it is amazing how the film also stands up over time i feel like this um I, I I don't feel that it has aged poorly. I feel like it is it has aged like a fine wine, frankly. Hundred percent agreed. But who asked you, sir? Uh who asked me? Uh this is this is certainly a, a, a tricky one, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Would you like me? To and I had, uh, yeah, please. <laughs> but who asked you, sir? Ah, screw you! I'll go first. Alrighty, because <laughs> this 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 has always always bothered me. He stayed by his posts when the trainees ran, and he's crying. Yeah, why, Scotty? Why are you crying? <laughs> why are you crying for this? You know, yes, young kid and everything like that. Of course, it's tragic, but it felt like I felt like I was missing something, and it wasn't until years later that I realized actually I was missing something. That kid was his nephew. Mm. So my who asked you, which to remind the audience, who asked you is what would you do differently if you could? I would have kept the David Preston being Scotty's nephew story intact. So that scene would have hit like a real gut punch as it was meant to. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's very valid, and I I'm with you that it took me years. I mean, I I don't think it ever threw me uh, when I first saw it that that Scotty just you know just felt bad for this kid. He was he was a really good kid. He did what he's right, and and it was much much later that I ever found out that that was that the kid was written to be his relative. Uh, so yes, I'm with you there, and uh, yeah, would I'd be curious to see how it would be if they left it intact well that's me sir how about you thank you thank you very much <laughs> um what am i gonna say i really don't can't think of anything 
Uh, I tell you what, I I I I'm really grasping at straws, so I I think I'll take this opportunity just to to hit some low hanging fruit, and I I think uh, over the years I've come to realize that the uh, the model they used for Chekhov's ear is a little fake looking. Uh, I'll just. <laughs> Because I'm really struggling to to sort of pick anything of any substance, frankly. Um, so I'll just give it to that. Yeah, for what it's worth, they actually built a large size version of his ear. Yeah, like like so like so large that somebody made like a six foot tall Q tip as a joke to go with it. <laughs> so, that should, so, that, so that should tell you everything you need to know about that. But yeah, you know what? Yeah. I, I'll give you that because it's it's a little the 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 SETI eel creatures. What a great idea, and they look amazing. But the crawling on the ear part just was. You know, like when when they when they put the helmets on them and the little guys were like actually on their cheeks at the time, that looked great. Yeah. That was a great effect. That oh, was yeah. a great practical effect. And, but then you're right, and then, chilling actually. Yeah, but but you're right. When they did the big, and I understand why they would have wanted to do the big ear because they wanted to do that scene where the little you know tongue comes out and you actually see it go in the ear and make the audience instinctively go to their ear. I, yeah. I get it. I understand why you did it. But that is definitely that's definitely weak sauce looking. <laughs> I'll grant you that one. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, weirdly, I feel like this is almost harder for your consideration. Mm. Who's going first? I uh, after you, sir. I took the last one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I'm going to, uh, you know, again, I, I, I hit on this before. Um, I, I, I want to go back and give it to the, the way they did Spock. I, I thought, I really do think that the way they sort of played Spock in this one, it really did sort of graduate his character to the next level. I felt like every conversation that they had, that Kirk and Spock had, um, Every interaction, it really did sort of give him sort of a new dimension where, like I said, it was it was almost like he, he's kind of got this Yoda vibe to him. He's he seems much more calm, very worldly, you, you know, like the wisdom is just sort of it's 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 radiating from him. Uh, and, and again, I, I really think that it's it's because the script is so well written uh, that they were were smart enough to do that. Um, it, it's interesting, too, because, you know, one of the things about this film is 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 Kirk feeling his age, which ironically, they kind of start to mimic in the Kelvin in the third film, <laughs> which which I, and I know we talked about it already. We, we've done the, those films already. Um I remember thinking, like, like he's in his third year as Captain Kirk on the Enterprise. Why is he already doing this, feeling old, feeling bored routine? The whole point of this film, um, you know, is that they're 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 saying that Kirk was in his prime when he was the captain of the Enterprise. Uh, so yeah, but I, I I like how they're taking all these characters and develop developing them a little further. Uh, but I really do think that they they really kind of hit a sweet spot with Spock. All right, you know what? I can get behind that. I agree. This is Spock at his best, and I see zero issue with that. I yeah. I, I, I love the portrayal. I'll agree with you a hundred percent. And you, sir? I'm going low hanging fruit, my man. <laughs> I, I I have to I have to admit <clears throat> I I need you to understand just how much I enjoyed this particular thing from the moment that uh, Kirstie Alley's Savick says it's one of ours, sir. It's Reliant, and Spock replies, "Reliant comes the most outstanding orchestration for yeah. a Star Trek movie ever." But a bump. Bump, 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 bump. Mm. Oh my God, James Horner. God yeah. rest your soul, sir. That was you at the top of your game, as far as I'm concerned. I, I am so glad you went there because I, I, I can't believe I forgot to mention it because there were so many points early on when we're talking about the climax and the, the, the two ships stalking each other in the nebula blind. Uh, 
oh boy, that um, that score is fantastic, and it really does elevate the whole thing. So yes, I'm with you 1,000 percent there. That man was taken from us too soon. He had a lot of great soundtracks. He also did the yeah. soundtrack for the second Alien movie too. So oh yeah, yep, uh, James Horner. But yes, that um, that is my that is that is my uh, for your consideration. I will always stick to that. James Horner never got enough. Well, you know what? Maybe he did because he had a tremendous career after this. But I always remembered that soundtrack. I always yeah. remembered. I used to hum it all the time. You know. Yeah, absolutely tremendous. I'm, I'm very well done, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's low-hanging fruit, but there it is. <laughs> Come! Come! At the end of the universe lies the beginning of vengeance. Star Trek II. The Wrath of Khan. And, sir, that's it. That is that the is, end of our review of Star Trek The Wrath of Khan. And and not one of us did our impression of Kirk yelling, Khan! <laughs> and here I am talking about low-hanging fruit, for God's sake. That, <laughs> that is the lowest of the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I, I, I thought about it. I thought about it as for the opening. And it's like, no, everybody does that. And it's like, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, wanted to, I wanted to make sure I, I threw out to Alex Kirkman that, you know, stop using this as a goddamn blueprint. Right, right, right. <laughs> there you go. Ah, uh, well done, sir. I uh, agreed, sir. Agreed. I, I have a lot of fun to do. But next week, ladies and gentlemen, oh goodness, the Star Trek mania continues. That's mm. right. That's right. Guess what? We're on a search. We're on a search for Spock, ladies and gentlemen. And that's going to be the next show. I hope you're looking forward to it, because Lord knows I am. <laughs> Uh, same here. I think that's. I think uh, going forward is when we'll start to get into l- some cracks in the armor, and we'll talk about why. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. I am too, sir. I am too. Uh, all kidding aside. Um, but hey, listen. Congratulations on the move. I am so glad that uh, you know there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and um, I look forward to doing search across Spock for you next week. And apologies, ladies and gentlemen, for us being uh, behind on this. Um, you know, real life and moving, you know, we try. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, you, you're right. And thank you for your patience, my friend. Uh, but I am in the home stretch. So uh, with that, <laughs> thank you, my friend, once again. And I will see you here next week. Pistolero! Thanks for listening to the Reviews Without Remorse podcast with Joe and Dave. Join us here every Thursday for a new episode. And be sure to check out the Reviews Without Remorse channel on YouTube for spoiler-free reviews of new releases. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You can find our page on patreon.com. As little as $1 a month goes a long way. All clips in this podcast are used for commentary and critique, and is considered fair use. No copyright infringement is intended.